<laughs> That's good, yeah. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Today we'll be looking at uh, verse 3 through 6. I titled the message, um, The Key Ingredient for Serving God. As Paul is now going to begin to apply the exhortation that he gave in the first two verses. You remember in verse 1 and 2, Paul exhorted us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And he said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way that happens, as we looked at last week, is through spending time in God's Word. As we read, as we study, as we think upon the Word of God, the Scriptures, um, we will find that they'll begin to shape our thinking. And gradually, over time, your thoughts will come into line with God's. And as we do that, Paul said, we'll be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, we'll be able to discern what the will of the Lord is for our lives and how we ought to serve Him. And so, as we come to verse 3, um, from verse 3 all the way to the end of this chapter, Paul's going to give us a picture of what a living sacrifice looks like. Um, how, it, how it looks in the church as we serve Him with the gifts that He's given us, and also how it looks in our behavior uh, towards believers and unbelievers alike. Uh, the, the characteristics that are to mark the Christian. Now, from verse 3 through 8 in this chapter, if you're taking notes, you can divide the chapter up um, really in three parts. Verse 1 and 2 is the exhortation to be a living sacrifice. Verse 3 to 8, um, Paul deals with specifically with spiritual gifts and the use of spiritual gifts in the church. And then from verse 9 all the way to the end of the chapter, it's basically um, behave like a Christian. Behave like a Christian. All right, well, let's look at verse 3. Paul opens this section in verse 3 um, with saying, For I say, through the grace given to me. Or as the NIV, we'll stop there, as the NIV puts it like this, For by the grace given me, I say. So Paul opens this section of the chapter basically asserting his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's speaking here with the authority he had received from God. But note, I want you to notice that as he does that, he's careful to balance out that authority with humility. As he said, for I say, through the grace given to me. Amen. He confesses here that, yes, he's speaking authoritatively, but he's doing so through grace. It was the grace that God had given to him. Paul knew that it was all owing to God's grace that he could really serve the Lord in any capacity, let alone have the high honor of being an apostle of Jesus Christ as God chose him really to um, take the place, I believe, of Judas as having that apostolic ministry that the, the 12 had. If there was 12, you remember there were 12 disciples of Jesus um, specifically called to be with him and to serve him, to be his uh, witnesses and to be his ambassadors to the world. Now, Paul knew it was all owing to grace. He knew he didn't deserve that. Um, let me quote to you, Paul, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. Listen to what he said. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That was Paul's view of himself. The chief and the worst of sinners. That's how he viewed himself. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, 
But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So Paul was careful to attribute all that he was and all that he did in service for the Lord to grace. How important that is. He viewed himself and his ministry as owing to God's amazing grace. And so here in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, as he opens up this new section about service, we see him use his authority humbly with the recognition that he had received this authority to speak in this way through grace. And in so doing this, listen, he set the example for the church. As he went on in verse 3 to tell of the key ingredient that must be present in all true service to God, which is humility. Let's, let's read verse 3 in its entirety. Paul said, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So Paul called upon the Christians in Rome to first and foremost have a sober estimation of themselves, not to think more highly of themselves than they ought to. And you know how important this is, especially when it comes to serving the Lord in the church, in the use of spiritual gifts. You know, the Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so before Paul gets into, into even describing the various spiritual gifts to be used in the church by the members, he first deals with the spirit and the attitude in which they are to be used Listen, which cannot be emphasized enough. The pastor I served under in Oxford um, used to say, your character must outrun your gifting. How true that is. You know, th there's nothing more important than character. Character eclipses all gifting. You could be the most gifted person in the world, but if your character is wrong, it will be a failure. It's a matter of time. You know, the Bible tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And of course, we have examples of this in the scripture. Um, I was thinking of King Saul. Remember Saul, um, Israel's first king? You know, at first, by the looks of Saul, he seemed to be the perfect choice to serve the Lord in that capacity. Uh, we read of him in the book of 1 Samuel that there was not a more handsome person than Saul among all the children of Israel. In that from his shoulders upward, he was taller than everyone else. And he even seemed humble at first. At the thought of being king when he was approached by Samuel the prophet. But as time went on in his service, it became very apparent that Saul's heart was not right. And that he was puffed up with pride. You remember when he was called upon to uh, perform the Lord's commandment in the, in the uh, case of, of the Amalekites. He wouldn't obey. You see, he was more concerned with his position. And he was more concerned with his own honor, not God's. And thus, eventually, Saul was rejected by God from being king. And so what we learn from this is that, listen, listen, gifting, looks, personality, you know, these are not the things that matter. What, what God is most concerned with is the attitude of the heart. And the motives behind the service and the use of gifts that God has given. Again, character, motive, attitude, humility. These things come first. That's why Paul addresses it very this right away before he even gets into um, serving the Lord in the church. Uh, listen to what I want to quote you from John MacArthur. John MacArthur said, No matter how well grounded we may be in God's word, how theologically sound we may be, or how vigorously we may seek to serve him, our gifts will not operate so that our lives can be spiritually productive until self is set aside. Amen. Hear that? Until self is set aside. Paul, writing to the Philippians, said this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. 
important this attitude is when it comes to serving the Lord in any capacity. Whether it's preaching, being a pastor, or just doing the menial tasks around the church. The attitude in which we do them is everything to the Lord. This is the attitude that God desires we have in using spiritual gifts. And so that's why Paul addresses this need first. Is he called upon the Christians in Rome not to think more highly of themselves than they ought to? You know, he was telling them, don't have an inflated view of yourself, but think soberly and, and have an accurate estimate of yourself. How important that is, that we don't um, think that we're all that, you know? <laughs> Bag of chips. Sorry. <laughs> You don't have that kind of attitude. <laughs> now, this is not a characteristic that the world uh, is fond of. The world teaches the exact opposite of this. The world tells us to assert ourselves, to promote ourselves, to exalt ourselves, and to make sure that everyone else thinks highly of us, too. And if they don't think highly of me, then I'm going to be angry at them, and I'm going to be mad at them. But it's the exact opposite of how we're called to be. And, and look at the way Jesus conducted himself. When Paul gave that appeal for us to let nothing be done through selfish ambition, he then pointed to Jesus. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he went on to tell of how Jesus humbled himself. And he became a man. He became a servant. He became of no reputation. In fact, we read, the prophet Isaiah tells us that he is despised and rejected by men. It's a hard thing for our, for our pride to handle when we feel despised. I know how that feels. Um, no one likes that feeling. To feel that you're worthless in someone else's sight. But the thing we have to remember is that we're never worthless in God's sight, no matter how others may treat us. That we're loved by Him. And that, listen, the Bible tells us a soft answer turns away wrath. Soft answer. You know, I was listening, my, I would be staying the night with my folks um, this weekend, and they were listening to David Jeremiah this morning. I was, I was listening to what he was saying. And in fact, he was quoting it from the end of this chapter where Paul talked about not avenging ourselves, but rather letting the Lord be the avenger. And he was talking about how when we seek to get even with other people, basically what we're doing, we're getting into a competition of who can be more evil. You've been evil to me. Now I'm going to outdo your evilness. I'm going to be even more evil to you. That's what getting even is. Listen, we got to set that aside if we're going to follow Jesus. Jesus said, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Yeah, it may hurt, but he'll be with you. And you know, he'll free you from those attitudes that are destructive anyway, and that are not of him. And so, Paul calls upon the church and us, listen, don't think more highly of yourself than you have. Have that sober view. Have an accurate estimate of yourself. Now, verse, uh, at the end of verse 3, um, Paul said that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Each one a measure of faith. And what that means is that, listen, God is not only the one who gives the spiritual gift, but he also gives the measure of faith to use the gift. It's all from him. It's all his gift. It's a gift of his grace. You know, believers, we are the recipients of God's grace and enabling as he has given each and every member of his church a spiritual gift in which to serve him, as well as the capacity for you to use that gift. He's given you the faith to step out and do it in your heart. You know, Paul said this to the church in Corinth. He said, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? That's the attitude we got to have when it comes to using our gifts. You know, pride, self-confidence, and boasting have no place in the church and in serving God through the use of spiritual gifts because God is the giver not only of the gift but also of the, of the ability to use the gift. It all comes from Him. Amen. Uh, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That's what 
Paul the Apostle confessed. He said he's made us able ministers of the new covenant through the power of his spirit working in our lives. And so understanding this is the key to serving the Lord appropriately, appropriately in a manner that will be beneficial to the church and to others. The attitude in which I come across is so important. And so Paul dealt with the attitude in which one must serve first. And you know, we just got to realize too that anything that I get to do for the Lord, that is a privilege. That's a gift from his grace and love toward me that I even get to serve. Now look with me at verse 4 and 5. Paul went on. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So Paul used the human body as an analogy of the church. The church of Jesus Christ, like the human body, is one unit comprised of many parts, each with its different function, all of which are necessary for the health and the well-being of the whole body. Um, Paul, using this same analogy in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14 to 18, listen to what he says. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? The whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. Who set, who's the one who gifted who and set the members in place? God, and he did it, notice, as he pleased. Whatever capacity he called you to serve in, it's as he pleases for your life. And it's what's best for you. And this is why we're not to seek to promote ourselves. Whenever we get into that, we're getting into the flesh. We're getting away from the Spirit. And so, the teaching here is that Christians are one body in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, we are members of one another. You know, I need you and you need me. You know? <laughs> and God has given to each member a gift to be used for the good and well-being of the whole body. You know, just... Think of it this way, just as, the, uh, the human just as each member of the human body must function and do its share in order for the whole body to be healthy, so too each member of Christ's body must function and do its share and use its gift for the good and well-being of all. And you know, we all know when one, one part of our body isn't working well, we know about it, don't we? Even if it's just your little pinky toe, that'll mess up the way you walk. Every single part is important. Every single Christian is important Amen. to the overall well-being of the body of Christ. And God has given to each one of you a gift. It's a gift from Him, from His Holy Spirit to use in the church. No, not one member can do it all. It's impossible. We all got to do our share. All right, as Paul went on, look at verse 6. He said, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So prophecy is the first gift that is listed. And what prophecy is, is the public proclamation of divine truth. What I'm doing right now, in some regards, is, is a, the work of prophecy. Now, the, the gift of prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and uh, we read on many occasions in the Bible of the Spirit of God coming upon the prophets in the Old Testament, as well as upon the apostles in the New, um, revealing to them God's Word and truth, and then inspiring them to proclaim it to others. Uh, which, And that, of course, has been uh, recorded and preserved for us in the Bible. Now, let me just say this before I go further on, on this gift. Um, with the completion of the New Testament, the revelatory aspect of this gift ceased. And what that means is that there is no new revelation uh, being given from God. Uh, 
in, in, you know, in the book of Jude, the short little epistle in the New Testament, just one chapter, verse 3, we read this, that the faith has once for all been delivered to the saints. Be faith. You know, and God warns in the book of Revelation against anyone who would add or take away from his words. Now, Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So, and so God's truth has been revealed in the Bible. And listen, it is complete. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, listen to what he said. He said that God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, through lust. The Bible is completely sufficient to meet every spiritual need that the Christian has. Peter said God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it's all right here through these exceedingly great and precious promises given to us from God to nourish our faith, to build us up, to encourage us as we follow Jesus and to help us hold on in those times that are really tough. It's all right here. It's given to us. We don't need to look anywhere else. We have no, there's nowhere else we need to go. It's rightly been said, you know, if, if it's new, it probably isn't true. And if it's true, then it isn't new. <laughs> so. Now, with that being said, why then do we still need the gift of prophecy to be exercised in the church? You know, with the completion of the Bible, what purpose does it serve? Well, the reason why this gift is still so important is because we all need the scriptures to be open to us. And we need the scriptures to be applied directly to our lives and personal situations. And, and this is where the gift of prophecy comes in. As the one who has this gift is able by God's spirit to speak directly into the lives of God's people using God's word. And the Holy Spirit takes that word and he applies it to you. And he speaks to you directly into your life and your personal situation. Remember, this is the living word. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that the word of God is living and it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's God-breathed, in fact, Paul said, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. For instruction, for correction. Everything is here. But the, prof the gift of prophecy is so important. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. It's one of the uses, uses of this gift. Now this gift is often in use when the minister is teaching and preaching from God's word on a weekly basis. You know, most pastors have had the experience of being inspired in the pulpit to say things that uh, they did not plan on saying when they started out. And having people come to them and ask them, you know, how they knew what they were going through and that they needed to hear that very thing that was said during the message. Listen, that's the gift of prophecy at work. As the Spirit of God takes the Word of God being taught and applies it directly to the specific situation and need of the individual Christian listening. It's an important gift. Now, this gift can also be used to bring uh, conviction directly into the life of an unbeliever. Um, again, from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse 24 and 25, Paul said that if an unbeliever comes into the church while this gift is in use, that it will bring conviction, and that it will lead to the secrets of his heart being revealed, and he will fall on his face and worship God. Amen. Read that, 1 Corinthians 14, 25. So this gift is extremely important and it's still very much needed today as through its use, God's word comes alive and is applied to the congregation and to anyone else who might be listening. And Paul lists it first here in the list of gifts, which should tell us that we, this is, and listen, this is one of the reasons why regular church attendance is so important for the Christian. 
Because through the use of, of this gift, your faith will be nurtured. It will be built up. As you come and as you sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word, the word of God will invade your heart. God will speak to you about the problems you're going through. He'll comfort you. As Paul said, he who speaks, he who uses this gift speaks comfort and exhortation and edification to men. We all need that on a weekly basis, don't we? We need this on a week, sometimes a daily basis, I need this. Life can be discouraging. This world is difficult. People can be very hard on us. We need to hear from God. So that's what this, that's why this gift is so important. Now, the pulpit isn't the only place that this gift is used, but it is the most common, I would say. I believe that this gift is also in use during the time of worship. Um, and, you know, one of the things about worship, singing worship and praise songs, is that there's a teaching aspect even in that. As you sing the songs, you're also being taught. Paul said that we should be singing spiritual songs, teaching one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. As we sing the praises of the Lord, as we think about the, what we're singing, we begin to be edified and comforted and strengthened, and God begins to minister to our hearts and lives. That's why the time of worship is also so important. It's a special time between you and God, where you praise Him, but listen, He also gives back. He gives back. So this, this gift is at, is at work in the church. Um, in fact, I, God can use this gift anytime he wants to. There's been times, um, I don't know if, some, if you guys have the Bible app, and you know, I get the verse of the day every day, and there's been times where I've been struggling badly with, with something, and the verse of the day will just speak directly to my life, to my situation. Amen. So, so the, this is so Paul here lists the gift of the Spirit gift of prophecy. And he says, so if this is your gift, use it in proportion, though, to your faith. As God enables you, use it. And as God gives you understanding, use it. Now, I'll stop because if I go on, we could be here for a long time. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I know you're thinking about in and out right now. And hopefully <laughs> not. But, <laughs> thanks, Dad. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but we'll stop there. Um, Next week, we'll look at the rest of the gifts in detail, and also um, with the emphasis from Paul for us to use these gifts um, for the benefit of the body of Christ. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, um, living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, completely sufficient to meet every need that we have, to bring comfort and edification and exhortation to men. So, Lord... Help us to hold on to these exceedingly great and precious promises that have been given to us. That we might be partakers of the divine nature, as Peter said, escaping the corruption that is in this world through lust. As your word keeps us on your path. And now, Lord, prepare our hearts to come before your table and remember the greatest sacrifice of all, which was your death on the cross, which opened the door for us to come to God. We ask this in Jesus' name.